Sappho was a Greek poetess who lived in about 600 BCE, which is about 2,600 years ago. Ancient Greece was a patriarchal culture, um, and that means that the man was the centre of authority, of law, of uh, sexual relations, of, of the household, um, and this is true of all of history until very recently. Um, but I think I'd go a bit further and say that Greece, um, ancient Greece, was also phallocentric, and I, that means that on a sophisticated level, that means everything that they wrote was about um, men, about just if you talk about love, if you talk about desire, it's generally from the male perspective. We just don't know really how women dealt with sexual desire or love, or rather we do, we get some glimpses of it. And the, one of the areas we get these glimpses, or one of the people we get these glimpses from is of course Sappho, who wrote about um, love between women, women loving um, whoever actually, loving daughters, actually sometimes loving husbands, some, and also loving other women. So these, that's a tantalising glimpse that we have of how women might have felt. At a time when most of her male contemporaries, if not all of them, were writing rousing military marches and enormous epics, Sappho was working on traditionally more female subject matter in a stereotypical sense, such as mothers, daughters and lovers. Some say a host of cavalry, others of infantry, and others of ships is the most beautiful thing on earth, but I say it is whatsoever a person loves. Sappho's poetry is also almost transgressively sensual. There's such an emphasis on the physical and on things like apples and flowers and temples and recesses and places where women can sort of be alone together and, you know, spend time with each other in a world that's sort of free of men. Where is your delightful grove of apple trees and altars smoking with incense? Zappo lived on Lesbos, which is an island in the North Aegean, so not very far from today's Turkish coastline. The women of Lesbos had a loose reputation. They were um, seen as doing things that perhaps other women, um, respectable women in the ancient world, wouldn't do. Um, um, sexual practice in the ancient world, um, there's hierarchies of it, essentially, um, and there's kind of quite a lot of debate of actually whether um, Athenian men had actual sex with boys or whether it was sex in the thigh, or how they did it. Um, and one of the practices that certainly by the Roman period was seen as um, sort of more dirty than anything else was actually oral sex. And I mean dirty in the sense of, you know, actually unclean, as well as, you know, dirty and risque. Um, and lesbians, as in people from Lesbos, women particularly from Lesbos, had a reputation of being a bit more loose and loush with their morals than other Greek women. Um, and so there were kind of stories of lesbians not necessarily being lesbian in the sense that we, we know it today of women loving women, but of lesbians, you know, basically giving, having, giving all sex or, you know, being a bit up for it. Zaffe wrote poems to women and about women, um, and the, the long poem to Aphrodite, it, the object of her love, is female. Yea, though now she loves not, she shall soon love thee. Yea though she will not. It wasn't translated until the 19th century as being female. And the reason for this is because, obviously, um, just female-female desire was not considered, well, it wasn't considered respectable, it wasn't considered something women did, it was also considered criminal um, in many countries and many places. Um, so it just wasn't translated like that. Um, and there was just a suppression of that kind of sexuality and that kind of sexual desire. Sapphic was a common code word from the 19th century onwards. When you read Sarah Waters tipping the velvet, Diana Letherby, a uh, dominatrix, salonier, wealthy woman of means, has a party, and she puts on the invitation, Sapphists only. Sapphist was something that women could call themselves, an identity that they could find themselves in, in a world that was quite often misogynistic and didn't allow them much space. Some of her biggest influences have come since we've discovered more of her poems and because that almost came with the exact moment of kind of modernism of the kind of fragmented idea of poetry so the fact that her poems were in tatters didn't seem to matter so much. There's so much space in Sappho's work that authors who are women or who are queer or who have any who have ever been in love can insert themselves into those spaces. 